All right, enough chatter, enough chatter. We've got things to do this morning, people. We're doing talking during church. Um, but in all seriousness, uh, there are so many things that we could probably go on and on forever. And I know some of us are like, oh, Mike, don't make me talk. I just hate that. But I, I, I love it. It starts with kind of like this awkward, what do I say? And then it kind of gets quiet. And then the conversations start to build. Uh, as we start to remember the things that we value about God's word, there's just a list can go on and on and on. And, and I want you to know as a church, um, one of the, the primary values that we have and we hold is the word of God. But why? Um, so for the time that we have left, I want to ask the question, why the Word of God? I mean, of all the things that we could have wrestled with and said, what do we want at the top of our list? I mean, there's so many different things that are good. Why is it that the Word of God made it to the top? And, um, and I'd like to respond to that question, why the Word of God, with, with three R's. Um, so everyone say three R's. Okay, put it all together and you get R, y'all pirates. I don't know what this. But three R's uh, when it comes to the Word of God. Um, it's at the top of our, our church family. But if we're honest, more and more people are growing skeptical about what to do with this book. Um, and if we're honest with ourselves, uh, there are parts of the book, and there's parts of reading the Bible that become confusing, difficult, challenging, um, and that maybe even cause us to question. There's sometimes that we confront pages where God says things. We're like, is that the God that we worship? There's things in the Bible that are wild, and, and there's things in the Bible that are fantastic, and there's things in the Bible that are encouraging, and there's things in the Bible that are hard to swallow. Why the Word of God? Um, is, is we have the privilege in our high school ministry to talk with lots of students from lots of different walks of life. And I'll never forget about six years ago um, in, in Stag High School, we were doing kind of a little outreach thing there. And I met a young girl named Kaylee. Um, and she shared a little bit about what we were doing and her thoughts about the whole church thing. And we just kind of asked her, like, where do you stand? What do you believe about God? What do you believe about the Bible? Is it weird that we're here talking about these things? And she was honest, and, and she actually ended up coming to the student ministry for a while, and it was really, really encouraging. Um, but she, she said this. She said, I think the church has a lot of good people in it. I see a lot of really good things coming out of it. I think that Jesus was probably even a really good teacher, a really great guy. Um, but I have a hard time believing in the Bible. Um, she went on to use the words, no offense, but... Now, I don't know if you've ever had that conversation with somebody who's like, well, no offense, but, and you just know that they're just basically using that as a license to offend you. Have you ever said, no offense, but I'm going to step on something that's really important to you and squash it right in front of you and feel really good about it. But she actually did it with a real sweet heart, and she said, no offense, but why are my pages falling off the back? Where did this come from? This could cause problems later. Um, uh, anyways, she started, she started with a no offense, but, and she went on to this list. Now, I, I don't know, if you, if you were to think about the people that you talk with, um, and maybe some of these are questions that you've had, but if you were to talk with somebody outside the church, um, there's probably more people outside the walls of a church right now on a Sunday morning than there are inside a church, and they have these questions. Um, these are the lists that she gave, and she had, like, I was expecting her to say, like, well, I don't know, it's just tough to read, or I don't read much, or, I mean, she just fired these things off there on the top of her tongue, and she said this, she said, the Bible's dated, I think the slide's up there. I think it's exaggerated. I mean, there's some crazy, miraculous things that happen. Parting of a Red Sea, like, that's just really, I mean, in a, in a day of science, aren't we a little bit past this stuff? They're nice stories, but do I need that for God's authority in my life? Is it historically accurate? I mean, I've heard that there's just a lot of stories in there, but does it really even line up with history, or are they just nice stories? It's out of touch. I mean, this is a book that was written thousands of years ago, and, and so how do we have a book that's thousands of years ago speak to me today? It doesn't speak to so many of the issues that I address. There's contradictions in the Bible. Aren't there? I mean, I've heard there's contradictions. I've, I've heard people, I've heard professors and other people stand up and say, the Bible has contradictions, and therefore there, we, should, we should discredit it. Um, in further conversation, she said it was written by people. And why do we say it was written by God? I mean, God didn't, like, just float a pen in, in Wingaria Leviosa in, like, Harry Potter style, and, oh, and the pen just sat down there and wrote itself. It was written by the hands of men. How do we say it's written by God? And then in further conversation, she said, you know, actually, I tried. I said, you know, what if you read it? And she said, well, I tried reading it for myself, but to be honest, it's kind of boring. It's a little hard to understand. Um, and some of the things I've heard from it um, are um, narrow-minded um, and kind of judgmental. And when I questioned my friends about it, it was slammed down my throat. So I don't understand this, and it was slammed down my throat, so, so no thank you. Can you relate to any of these questions on this list? Do you know people that can relate to the questions that are on this list? Now, our mission is to have the world see and treasure Jesus here, there, and everywhere. 
And we have friends and families that we want to come to treasure Jesus. And we're a people who treasure Jesus by reading his word and loving him. And, and we want them so badly to know why we value the world. But these questions are out there. And these are oftentimes the questions that we have. And I found myself so badly wishing that there were some students that were ready and prepared to talk with Kaylee with her questions. With the Kayleys out there, how do we address these questions? And so I want to give three R's in response to these questions. And my hope for us is, is this, is that we would leave as a body of people more encouraged and more excited about what God's given us in his word. And that whether we, we pick it up once a week, twice a week, we read it every day or whatever, that, that we'd allow this book, however little or much that we read it, to get through in us and change us and shape us and that we'd be so encouraged by it And then the second thing is this, is that I want us to walk away feeling like, you know, the world does have a lot of questions. I'm not crazy for believing this thing. There actually is good reason to build my life on these pages, and I want to have language to invite other people to do the same. What I don't want to have happen this morning is is to give arguments that people have given and then use these arguments to hold it over other people and say, can't you see? This is what it is. This is what happened. But instead, the Bible is always an invitation. It's an invitation to say, "I'm, I'm building my life on it. Can I... Can I show you why? And so these are these three answers, these three R's. And so for those of you that like to know where the whole thing is going, you like to put the destination in MapQuest or MapQuest, does anyone use MapQuest anymore? Wow, Uh, with Google Maps or an an Apple Maps, whatever you use, um, you like to know the destination before you start driving. Here's where we're going this morning. We value God's word because it's reliable. We value God's word because it reads us. And we value God's word because it hinges on a resurrection. It's reliable, it reads us, and it hinges on a resurrection. In other words, um, when we have the conversation with somebody else, and we say, like, why, do you, why, do you, why this book? We can simply say, you know what? This, this is, this is, it's reliable. I found it to be a reliable thing for my life. And as I read it, I discover that it reads me. You should try reading it yourself. And, and ultimately, this whole thing hinges on a hope that's built around a resurrection, and it changes everything. So the first reason to, to jump right in this morning, you guys ready, by the way? We're, we're good? We're still here? We're tracking? Okay. So the first reason is that the Bible is reliable. The book that we have here is a reliable source in so many ways. And some of these arguments you probably have heard, I just hope that we can just reaffirm and strengthen ourselves in this. But did you know that the Bible is the most printed and bought book in the world? And I just learned uh, yesterday that also is the most shoplifted book in the world, ironically enough, um, which is pretty interesting. But with so many in print, how can we say it's reliable? Is it just a collection of stories and morals, um, or is there more to it? It was written thousands of years ago by multiple people. doesn't have contradictions. Historically, is it accurate? Um, and wasn't it changed over time to fix and fit different people's agendas? So many different conspiracy theories out there. One recently was, not recently, actually several years ago with like the Da Vinci Code and other things. I mean, there's all these conspiracies that are behind the Bible. Is the Bible really a reliable source for us to read? And we could spend an entire week and month on these questions one at a time, and I I guarantee there's an answer for all of them. But one of the reasons we value the Bible, um, say over other ancient texts, stories, and beliefs, is that the Bible stands out as one of the most reliable, historically accurate books in human history. Um, first, the, the dates, the people, the events, and the times mentioned in Scripture have more outside sources confirming it uh, through archaeology and other writings um, than any other ancient book of its time. In other words, the Bible doesn't sim- simply say it's a case of my word against yours. I mean, for example, like I could say that when I was younger, I had this bike and I could ride it so fast that I could fly. And I might have felt this. Like, have you ever, like, built ramps, anyone here? Like, I know the Cervix probably build them. You guys, are, you guys probably build ramps in your house because you're a builder. Um, but you build a ramp, and you jump, and you're like, I could fly. But that, I, not just that kind of fly, but I literally can go, like, two, three stories high. I could fly and visit my parents, and it was awesome. It was awesome. End of story. And you could say, well, that sounds kind of unbelievable. But I could say, well, no, I believe it because that's what I said. And there it is. It's my word against yours. You weren't there, so it happens. I can, I can say whatever I want to say. But unless someone was there with me to say, hey, I saw you had a bike, you could jump pretty high, but you definitely couldn't fly, um, they can corroborate with my story. They can either confirm or deny what I wrote. Um, The Bible could just be a collection of stories about about, um, parting of seas and kings and queens and, and fantastic battles and all these different people. And we could look at this and say, that's great, but did it really happen? One of the questions that often comes up is great, but if, if it didn't happen, then why do we read it? Then they're just myths and legends. Um, and it would be hard to swallow, except the Bible has more than any other ancient text outside sources um, 
that support it. Um, and we would actually say that you would think that archaeology and with the advancements of archaeology and study of, of history and culture that we would be uncovering things that would refute the Bible. What's actually surprising scholars and a lot of level of scholarship is that we're actually finding the opposite happen. We're actually finding more and more evidence that supports the Bible. Now, while there are certain things that we can't find because we can't dig up everything and lots of things have been moved or they weren't built with sustainable materials or lasting materials, so some of these things, sure, may have come and gone, but what we're finding is that everything that we find, rather than refute the facts of the Bible, actually support the facts of the Bible. Um, and once it was long debated, as an example, once it was long debated that the Israelites were ever even in Egypt during the time of Exodus. This was something that was said when I was in college. I was a new believer, and I wasn't even sure about school, and I had a philosophy professor, and we had lots of different conversations. It was my senior year, and, and she was really great, and she knew a lot about the Bible. And she, one thing she kind of challenged with me, she's like, well, you know, you believe this Bible, but did you know that there's no evidence to say that the, the, the Israelites, that the Jewish people were ever even in Egypt during the book of Exodus. And isn't so much of the Old Testament built on the book of Exodus? How can you say this book is true when there's nothing to support that? And I walked away saying, whoa, I don't know. I mean, it seems to work when I read it, but maybe it isn't. Maybe I'm just, just kind of getting this all caught up in my head, and then I start spiraling in that thought. Have you ever been there when someone throws a question your way? Well, one thing you get to know is that you never have to be afraid of people's questions because those questions just lead you to realize just how much bigger God is than your questions, and it's a fantastic thing. But um, as you move in, there, there's actually been lots of research over the past couple decades um, that have excavated Jewish architecture that dates, dates roughly back to the time of Joseph. Uh, there are floor plans that are distinctly Jewish, building plans that are just outside of Egypt, um, well within the time of Joseph. Um, and they've also unearthed... Um, um, property manifests among Egyptian homes that list distinctly Jewish names in their slavery manifest. So not only does the Bible say that there was Jews in captivity and the Israelites were in captivity during, uh, in Egypt under the reign of a, of a pharaoh, um, but that not only does the Bible say it, but there's actually other evidence that says, hey, there are actually Israelites living in Egypt at the time that the Bible said Egypt, Israelites were living in Egypt. And there's actually other things going on to support and corroborate that they weren't only there, but they go back as far as the time as we think Joseph was alive. Um, so all this stuff seems to support this, but it, it just goes on and on. There's more and more of this to support it. There's an Egyptologist who said it's an unequivocally undeniable that there is an Israelite presence. I won't quote him because i got to keep moving. There's so much stuff to pull out of this. But there is an ancient... Um, a poem, and it was called the, uh, the Ipuer Papyrus. I don't know if I'm saying it right, Ipuer Papyrus. Um, and it's an ancient document. It was kind of a poem and a lament that was written. Um, it was written, um, and it, was <clears throat> it could possibly include an independent record of the 10 plagues. And what I mean by that is that this is a separate thing that was written that wasn't found in the Bible, that as you read it, it's striking and eerie how similar they are to the 10 plagues. I'll just give you a couple examples of this. Um, so if, again, we could say that the 10 plagues happened in the Bible. It seems pretty miraculous and kind of hard to swallow. Is there other evidence out there that maybe supports that this event took place? And the Ipera of Pyrus, it says, the plague uh, is throughout the land. Blood is everywhere. The river is blood. Men shrink from, taste, uh, men shrink from tasting human beings, and thirst after water. This is our water. That is our happiness. What shall we do in respect thereof? All is ruin. In the Bible, Moses turns the river to blood. Did it happen? Well, this seems to, this seems to suggest, I'm just putting this out, there's lots of debate as to what this is referring to, but it's written around the time of Exodus. It was excavated around that time, and it seems to support this. Another example was the 10th plague uh, in Exodus, which is referred to the death of the firstborn sons. And here's another part of that l lament. Well, actually, Exodus 12.30 says this. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. The Ipera virus says this in several places. Forsooth, which means like forsaken. We were forsaken. That's very Egyptian, though. Forsooth. Uh, that was more English, I don't know. Forsooth, the children of princes are dashed against the walls. Forsooth, the children of princes are cast out in the streets. He who places his brother in the ground is everywhere. Literally, they're watching people bury their dead all around them. It is groaning throughout the land, mingled with lamentation. That's one thing for the Bible to say something happened. And we could take it in faith, and that's good but it's even more incredible to know that there's actually support out there that says that these things that took place actually took place. 
But what about the folktales? I mean, isn't it like a folktale? These people that we wrote about, wrote about the heroes of the Bible. I mean, couldn't it be that we just like took Jesus and his teachings and then we sort of trumped up his ideas and made him more miraculous than he really was? And some of these people about David and Goliath, could we just like just kind of beefed them up and said, hey, he's our hero. Let's make it more like a, a folktale. Uh, Timothy Keller in his book, Reason for God, does a great job uh, drawing from other scholars in this question. So if that's a resource and you like this kind of stuff, Timothy Keller, the book Reason for God, is definitely worth looking into. But he looks into this. He says, for folk tales and other oral traditions of the time, they show some things in common. The stories happen many generations after the actual events. The details vary from writing to writing. As time evolves, the writings evolve. And in other words, that, that well, there's the moral of the story, but the moral of the story changes as history changes and the people in the context of the story finds root. So maybe this is one political issue that the time the folktale is written, but then 10 decades later, the folktale resurfaces and they change some details to fit the agenda of its time. So the details vary over time. Details in the morals of the story include um, the morals of political agendas of the day. I mean, is it something that's simply supporting someone's uh, authority or an authority structure of kings. A lot of times, uh, religious writings and stuff were used to be lorded over people to create uh, authority structures. This is our authoritative text, and this is how we use the text to get our agenda across. Um, and that and also, um, folk tales don't follow the story and style of modern fiction. We live in a modern world, and so we live in a time where fiction's written a certain way, um, but uh, folk tales and ancient folk tales in particular follow a certain literary style that's not like modern fiction today. So keep that in mind. Um, except with the Bible, um, and especially with the New Testament, these stories were written within the lifetime of those who experienced it. Um, especially in the New Testament, some within 14 to 20 years after the events actually took place, which means that the people that wrote about it were actually living during the time that it happened, and that the people that were, when these stories were going in circulation, that anyone could have refuted the story, said, you know what? I love that story about Jesus rising from the dead, but I was there, and it didn't happen. Actually, I could show you where he's still buried. Anyone could have done that while the stories were being circulated. And it's still, they circulated and they continue to grow and it didn't stop. That's just one example. Um, another thing we find is that the details don't change to include modern events uh, to make the leaders look good or change the agendas. In fact, we see the opposite. Throughout the scripture, the heroes from the Old Testament to New rarely end up looking good. Oftentimes they look pretty bad, giving no credit to the people or the authority structures in place during those times. In other words, it'd be really hard to look at the Bible and use this to justify a political agenda because the people and the heroes that it's trying to support and build a movement from end up looking worse than the movement they're trying to create. The disciples who are trying to create a movement to follow Jesus, if they were to write a movement and put themselves in the best light possible, would have easily taken out any stories that made them look bad. But instead, you find them fumbling through faith, questioning what they're about, um, questioning Jesus' teachings even, and even at times walking away. They would exclude other details that would have discredited their messages, like including so many stories of women at the time who were not valued in society in the way that we value them today. Uh, we, we just, it's, it's, looking at women in the Bible would have been like, well, why are you including those stories? It doesn't help your case. Why include it unless it actually happened? Ancient fiction and oral fiction didn't include the same rules of fiction uh, that we have today. So like dates, times, specific events are completely absent in ancient writings, except in the Bible, we find people writing specific details, such as Jesus lying asleep at the helm of a boat. Those details would never have happened in folk stories unless it was a detail that was important that actually took place. Now, this topic can take a whole morning, obviously, and we're not going to go there forever. But I just want you to know that when you read this, that this book stands out amongst uh, so many other texts. Uh, the next question would be transmission, like how this Bible is passed from generation to generation to generation. It's thousands of years old. How do we know that what you have in your hand is actually something that was written that long ago and can be trusted and relied upon? Um, and so I know I've been talking a lot, and so we're going to listen to a quick video here. It's a, a few minutes long, um, but I think it summarizes what we're talking about here, and he's got a very exciting Bible voice, and so it'll energize us. And so, Pete, play the video. The Word. You've known of it your entire life. A book that sits on your shelf, sometimes granting wisdom and sometimes gathering dust. But can you trust what you have is actually accurate? You're talking about a book written thousands of years ago, before computers or printing presses. How can you be sure you have the words God wants you to have? Many respected ancient writings were only loosely based on facts, with the historical writers often getting key dates and locations absolutely wrong. 
That's because many of the writers did not live in the countries they were writing about. Some weren't even living at the time of the events they recorded. Not so with the Bible. Scripture was recorded by those who lived in that time and experienced what they recorded firsthand. Moses, for example, was there when God gave the Ten Commandments. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were there and experienced the life of Jesus. So there is no doubt that what was written down was historically accurate because those who wrote it lived there at the time. But what about the handwritten copies that came later? Doesn't it seem that over time as one writer copied the word for future generations, that words and potentially entire passages would get rephrased and perhaps even omitted? How do you know the Bible you read is the Bible that was originally written? Wait! To answer that, you must go back to the way scripture was hand copied into manuscripts. For centuries, three groups of people took the care of the Old Testament scriptures as seriously as life and death. They had strange names like Sophorim and Masoretes, and they were obsessed with the intricate minutia, requiring a system of double checks and triple checks to ensure extreme accuracy in any reproduced copy of scripture. If one mistake, even one letter, was found to be inaccurate, the entire copy was destroyed. So you can be confident that copies were made accurately. But how do these ancient manuscripts compare to the printed Bible we have today? In early 1947, a goat got himself lost in the caves off the coast of the Dead Sea. A young boy searching for the goat found jars filled with ancient Old Testament manuscripts. Scholars confirmed that when these earlier Old Testament manuscripts dated 125 BC were compared to later manuscripts dated 916 AD, the Dead Sea Scrolls were identical, word for word, in more than 95% of the text. The variation of 5% pertained almost exclusively to spelling variations. In other words, in over a thousand years, the only changes were in spelling and did not affect in any manner the meaning and intent of those scriptures. But what about the New Testament? Well, scholars evaluate the reliability of ancient literature by two standards. One, the time interval between the original and the earliest copies. And two, how many manuscripts are available. For instance, scholars deem Homer's Iliad of utmost accuracy because the time gap between the original and the earliest copies is a mere 400 years, and there are 643 copies in existence. In the same manner, Caesar's Gallic Wars is considered accurate even though its time span is a thousand years with only 10 copies. The New Testament, on the other hand, has no equal in these two criteria. No historic writings even begin to come close. The span between the writing of the Bible and the earliest copy is only 50 years, and nearly 25,000 manuscripts survive to this day. Take that, Homer and Caesar. But why? Why is this accuracy so important? Because, in effect, it means God is saying, I protected my written word to you all these years so that you could hold it in your hand, read it, and know that it is an accurate revelation of me. I want you to know me and my ways, so I have given you my reliable word. And that is the final word. There you have it. <laughs> That is the final take that, Homer and Caesar. He's very passionate. And I, hope, I guess I feel like you're in school yet. Um, and so what I love about this, and what does this mean for us, is that means we have an incredibly reliable source to go to that has been miraculously preserved for thousands of years for you and I to engage with. Why do we say the word of God? Why, why would we pick that as our source? Because it's reliable. 66 different books wrapped into one. 773,692 words and about 70 hours to read this book out loud start to finish. 
And what's amazing about the Bible is it's written all by all sorts of different types of people. It's not written just by the noble or those in power, but it's written by poets, musicians, statesmen, farmers, politicians, shepherds, peasants, scribes, and even tax collectors. It was written in so many different types of locations. Moses in the wilderness, Jeremiah in the dungeon, David out in the field as a shepherd, and David hiding in caves on the run. Luke while traveling and in, in interviewing the followers of Jesus, Paul while in prison, John while in exile, just to name a few. The Bible is written and takes place in 13 different countries, three different continents, three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, and covers a time span of over 1,500 years. And what's amazing that even though the Bible is written from all different types of people, from all different walks of life, over the span of millennia, the accuracy and the consistency when it comes to the message, the character, the nature of God and his redemptive plan for humankind, humankind is strikingly the same. Many authors Many years, one voice. And it's not like people huddled up and said, okay, this is what God should sound like. These are the attributes and characters we're going to give him. It's not like creating a character study and creating the next uh, great movie and action adventure where everyone kind of creates a character and collaborates how they're going to write about him. These people never met. They never spoke with each other. And they never collaborated. Um, and they never said, this is how God should sound. And yet when you read over and over again the voice of God, it is strikingly consistent and strikingly the same over and over again. And not only is it consistent, true, and inspired, and speaks to, it also speaks to so many different topics and relevancy is not an issue for us in the reliable word of God because contained within the pages of this book are topics like property, finance, generosity, self-worth, human rights, marriage, divorce, remarriage, sex, lust, greed, materialism, parenting, prayer, prayer, Sorry, friendship, pride, murder, suicide, fears, doubt, love, romance, hate, government, submission, sacrifice, fullness of life, disasters, discipleship, fasting, honor, caring for those in need, the poor, injustice, equality, humility, boldness, direction, wisdom, and serving. And there is so much more, but especially God's extraordinary rescue of our beautiful but broken world. This is an incredible book that we hold in our hands, and it is incredibly reliable. So when we read Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul's words, when he says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, we can have confidence and trust that the Bible is a reliable place to get that training when it comes to living with and for God. The Bible is reliable. So why do we value the word of God? Because it's reliable. The second R this morning is we value God's word because it reads us. I mean, it's one thing to say that this is a reliable book, but it's, it's another thing to say that as we read it, does something happen? Um, and the, the, one of my favorite passages is found in Hebrews 4.12 is this. It says, for the word of God is li- alive, alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. We get this picture that as we read scripture, it begins to read us. That this word isn't just something that's meant to be held with high regard to hold over other people, um, but it's meant to be held inside of us. It shapes how we see the world. It judges our attitudes and gives us judgments for how we live our lives. This is an important distinction for us to make about the works. I think too often the outside world sees us as a church holding this over them. You, this is the Bible, get under this. This Bible is over you, get under this. This Bible should be held over you. And, and, and look at this. this is, the Bible says this, so live this way. And, and the Bible does provide ways of living. It does provide moral stances on lots of things. But the Bible is far less about pointing it out over there because when we read the word, we see that God seems far less concerned about what's going on out there and far more concerned about what's going on in here. And so when we read the word, it's not just to understand or create a stance or create a a platform, but it's to allow the word to get into us, to shape us, and to change it. So why do we value the word word of God? Is because as we read it, it begins to read us. The context of this passage has to do with faith. The author has gone to great lengths to show how people are missing out, experiencing the fullness of what God invited them into. Rest, hope, love, welcome, redemption, and victory. But because they didn't have faith to take God at his word, they missed out. And so the encouragement from the author in this text is to take God at his word because it's living and it's active. That as we read it, it reads us and calls us to faith. It reminds us of who God is, what he has done, and urges our souls to live with the same kind of radical and bold faith. And that it gets so close that it seemingly separates the inseparable. I love that. It says divides um, soul and spirit. 
um, joints and marrow, judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Are there any science lovers in here? Any science lovers here? A few. I know my wife is. She's raising her hand. Be proud. That's good. Um, she's a biology teacher. She's fa- fantastic um, and pretty good looking. So way to go. Um, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, I couldn't help myself. But the, um, as, as, we look at, as we look in science, like if you look at your hands, hold out your hands and you look at them and you can see your skin. But if you're like take a microscope and get a little bit closer, you'd realize your skin is made up of a bunch of parts. Like we look like we're one person, but then you get a little bit closer, you realize that you're made of parts. There's lots of parts too. And if you got a little bit closer to those parts, you'd realize that deep within those parts are actually cells that have parts. The parts of cells are in there. If you got even closer, you'd realize it's made up of molecules and that those molecules aren't just molecules, but they're made up of atoms and that those atoms actually have parts. And if you got even close to an atom, Atom, you could separate an atom with um, seeing the different parts of an atom with subatomic parts. With the right instrument and the right tool, you can realize that there's things that separate all these things. And, and what the writer of the Bible says is that as we read this, this can get so close as it can actually judge the hearts and thoughts, deep things, the deep things inside of us that we didn't know could even be separated, that it could separate those things and sort them out. I don't know about you, but that's, that's really good news for me. My life gets, uh, can be a train wreck sometimes. I can be confused. I can could, I could feel like I lose my way. I can not know where I'm doing. I doubt. I have lots of different um, insecurities. Um, and yet when I read God's word and it reads me, it starts to sort those things out. That God's word goes deep. But it has to be read to go deep. Um, if you think about it right now, you're living in an invisible space. I mean, you can see and, and think and feel out here. We see you. We see everyone. You can look around. You see people sitting in the chairs around you. But right now, there's thoughts going on in your mind and your heart. We can't see those things. And, and you, we could so easily present ourselves how we want to the, the outside word, but outside world. But when we let the word of God inside of us, it gets to that invisible space. Our thoughts and our attitudes and our hearts. And the Bible says that it judges us in those places. And for such a long time, I thought that word judgment was one of condemnation. But that word judgment actually carries with it the same idea of like making a judgment, saying what is, pointing out what actually is, making what's true known. So when the word judges our hearts and our thoughts, it points us out, it gives us judgment calls on how to live our lives. It points us out in the directions where we're going with God and the places that we're straying from him. And that the word of God actually gets in us as we read it and it actually confronts us in the places that no one else can see. And we can play the game all we want, but when we read God's word and we allow it to read us, it gets to that place where we can hide from everybody else, but we can't hide from God. Um, so the word of God confronts the places where you have questions, the places you have anxiety, the places that you have worry and doubt, the places that you hold a grudge, the places where you wrestle making the right decision, the places where you hold on to pride, the places where you judge others secretly. And it also affirms the places that you love, the places that you are called to serve, the places that you have compassion, um, the places that you hold on to hope. The word of God gets into those places and separates out doubt from faith. Uh, joint and, and marrow, soul and spirit, judging our hearts. God gets in that space, but it only happens when we read God's word. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this. It says, the heart is deceptive above all things and beyond cure. Who could understand it? And if I'm honest with myself, I'm really good at tricking myself into believing what I want to believe. I can make myself feel what I want to feel. If I, I, I'm really good at deceiving myself and sometimes making the wrong thing feel like the right thing. I can fight in my mind long enough and justify any action or behavior that I do. But when we hold up God's word to those thoughts and those actions, it judges them and corrects them and leads us into the life that God is calling us to do. It's not designed to just simply be a collection of promises um, that we're mined out and morals for us to follow, but it's rather to evoke a conversation with the God that's behind it all. And that's why the writer says that the word of God is living and active. The, the text itself, are just, it's just ink on a page. It's just, the, the mechanics of the Bible is just pens on a page. But these words and the truth behind these pages, the Bible says it's inspired, breathed by God. It's breath on a page for us as, as we're believers. And as we read it, we breathe it in. It's living and active because the same God that was there during this time is the same, and is gonna be the same God that's with you right now. And that as you read the word and as the word reads you, it's God's very presence with you calling you into the things that he loves and wants you to be a part of. And it doesn't just read us, it revives us. I love this. Psalms 19, seven through eight says this, the law of the Lord is perfect, 
reviving the soul. The statues of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. Well, why do you read the word of God? Well, it's reliable and revives my soul. As, as it reads me, it doesn't just condemn me, it doesn't just correct me, it doesn't just direct me, but it makes me come alive on the inside. That word revive has the idea of what, bringing what's dead to life. When you read the Bible, when we read the word of God together, it awakens things inside of who we are. Um, and actually, it's a big deal in this text too because have you ever been out and breathless looking at nature? Have you ever marveled at God under like the stars and said, wow, God, you're amazing? The beginning of that psalm starts that way. It's, it's uh, Psalm 119. He says, day and night, um, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to reveal knowledge. There is no speech where there are, nor the, where there are words where the voice is not heard. Their voice goes through all the earth and the world's, their words to the ends of the earth. He basically goes on to create this picture that, that the world is revealing God everywhere. And it's amazing and it's astounding. But for the writer of Psalm 19, what revives his soul isn't just getting out in nature and saying, wow, God's amazing. But it's allowing God's word to get inside of him because that's what revives his soul. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. And the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. I love the word revive and bringing what's dead to life. And I just wonder, what are some places in our lives right now that, that just need to be awakened? You know, when it comes to God's word, when it comes to faith, when it comes to living for him, things we maybe have heard before, it's one thing to know we've heard a story. It's another thing to go back and to read it again because when we do, it awakens things inside of us. So why do I value the Bible? Because it reads me. And the more I read it, the more I understand myself. And the more I read it, the more I understand God and the relationship he's inviting me to have with him. And the more that I read it, it's reviving my heart and it's making me come alive. And lastly, we value God's word because it hinges on a resurrection. The Bible is more than, a reliable, if the Bible is more than just a reliable book with messages that go deep to the heart. And that, in fact, that's all true. There's a lot of great morals and, and that stuff. But if that's all it is, it's a pretty confusing self-help book. I mean, let's just be honest. The Bible is just a collection of ways to live a morally upright life. It's a pretty confusing self-help book. If all this was just a collection of stories, then we're not much better off than anybody who doesn't read it. Maybe we live a more morally upright life, but, um, and maybe we have some principles that we could apply to our life to help us live a better life. But when all is said and done, we're all in the same condition, we're all in the same boat where we all die, and there's no hope beyond this. But... This whole word is, is not just something that's good for us, but it's validated and it's supported and it hinges on the resurrection of Jesus. That, that Jesus, because he came, he taught, he died, and he rose again, his followers were transformed forever. When we, when we come to this book, we could say this has got a lot of great moral teachings, but without that, there's no hope beyond the grave. But because this book points to a resurrection, because this point this book points to a savior who's gonna come live and die and rise again. We could know that as we trust the God of this book, we're actually experiencing a resurrection life and a hope that goes beyond the grave. That no matter what circumstance, no matter what trial, no matter what thing that we face in our life, that it does not get the last word in our life, but that we have an eternity with God to look forward to. And that changes how we live in our present day. And it hinges on a resurrection. What makes the book... Um, what makes this book so much more remarkable is that it speaks to a hope that is eternal, a life and relationship that death, even death, can't stop. In the Gospel of Luke, shortly after the disciples were buried and rose, uh, sorry, the disciples of Jesus was buried and rose again, uh, there was a lot of confusion of what took place. Um, and we see a couple of the disciples walking back um, and seeing their hero suffer and die. Um, and for them, all seems lost. And there on the walk back is one of my favorite exchanges in all scripture. It's called the road to Emmaus, and a lot of you were familiar with it. But Jesus there sees his disciples. They're discouraged. They're forlorn. I mean, imagine, you've built your whole life around trusting and following Jesus, and you just, you just don't know what to do with it. You're like, I, I thought I had the answer. His teachings were amazing. I saw him raise somebody from the dead. I saw all this stuff. I thought, man, this guy is going to be the revolution. I'm going to live with him. It's going to change my life. And you go and you watch him. And you're like, wait a minute. He just got arrested? Wait, what? That's him? That's him carrying the cross? No, wait, no, that's not. That. And then you watch, you're like, you know, this can't be. And then you watch him go and elevate on the cross. And you watch him breathe his last breath. And you're like, what was that all about? 
I mean, all these teachings were heading somewhere. All these things that God was teaching me was going somewhere. It was leading me someplace in my life, and I felt really great. And then it just ended in death. Is that all this was about? And there Jesus finds these two disciples that were experiencing and wrestling with these same things, and he walks up to them. And I just, I just wonder about the humor of Jesus sometimes. He's like, why the sad face? I mean, here he is, resurrected, walking next to them, and he sees them forlorn and questioning where things are at. And he says, why, why are you so sad? And they go on to say, where have you been for the past three days? Well, I, I could tell you. <laughs> where have you been? I mean, the, the one that we put our trust in, just, he, he died, and that's it. Game over. It's over. We, we're going back to life as usual. And I love how Jesus encouraged them. He says this, oh, foolish ones. <laughs> In love, I'm imagining. Oh, foolish ones. And slow to heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. This book that you knew, these pages that you read, they weren't just, they weren't just so you could live a moral life. They weren't just so that you can understand that you're God's people. But they point to me. And I've come to save you. And so it goes on to say, it says, you foolish ones, was it not necessary for the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one, to suffer these things and enter in his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them all the scriptures and all the things concerning himself. So why do we read the Bible? It's because this talks about the life of Jesus. And because Jesus rose from the dead, he's our only hope. We value this book because it brings us back to the hope that we have in Jesus that lasts forever, and that hope changes everything. A few of us on staff recently heard Andy Stanley say this, and I thought it was pretty helpful. He says, if a man could predict his own death and resurrection and then actually pull it off, I'd go with whatever he says. And Jesus values the word of God. And Jesus tells us that all these scriptures point to him and the hope that we have. So why do, we, why, do we, why do we make the word of God something that's so central to us as a church? Well, it's because it's reliable, but it's more than that because as we read it, it supernaturally reads us and it shapes who we are as a people. And lastly, it hinges on the hope and a resurrection that changes everything for how we live our lives. And that the early followers of Jesus were so moved and so encountered and so empowered by the resurrection that they gave everything up. They saw their savior pour out their lives and give everything for those that he loved, and so they, they in turn would go and do the same. And they had nothing to fear anymore because they knew that the grave didn't have the last word. Nothing could be held over them. And so they poured everything out for the world that they have on this side of eternity. And as we read the word of God, it invites us to encounter Jesus in the text. It encounters us to understand what he came for, why he came for, what he's offering for us, and the hope that we have so that we can go in turn and live and love others like he loved us that we don't have to be afraid to pour out our lives for the world around us, be afraid to love and give everything up, to give up our last breath because our Savior did that and he rose again. And we could trust that in him we'll do the same. So as a church, it's so important that we come to these things. And um, I think it's appropriate that we're, we're about to change our hearts and our mindset to communion. And as we get ready, I just, I just want to encourage you to take a moment and talk to God about him. Just talk to him and say why you value the word of God. As the ushers come forward and get the elements ready, why the word of God for your life? And maybe something was said today that just sort of like made you just feel, oh, that's great. Take a moment to thank God for it in your heart. God, thank you. Thank you that it's reliable. You're like, you know what? You're right. Forget that this whole book points to you. Thank you that because you died and rose again, that this whole book is validated through a resurrection. Jesus, on his last day before... Um, the last day before he was going to be arrested and betrayed, um, he uh, told his disciples, this is my body. It's broken for you. And he went on to say, this is, this is my new covenant in my blood shed for you. So we gather together around what it cost Jesus to, to come and live for us, and we remember that he gave us everything. But we also do this proclaiming that he rose again. He died and rose again, and one day he's coming back. And we find that in this word. And as we read it, it renews our faith and revives our hearts. I'm going to leave us for a few moments in silence, and Josh will come and take us through communion.